uh, we will be covering conditional logic. Um, in particular, uh, conditionally acknowledging tokens on input channels or conditionally emitting tokens on output channels. So let's get started. So for the first uh, problem statement, acknowledging uh, tokens on input channels conditionally, the CHP kind of, you, you have your kind of standard receive uh, on your inputs and then you emit on your output. We have a new channel though uh, to read in the condition. And so channel C represents the, you know, whether or not we read on A or we read on B. Uh, and so if C is zero, we read on A. If C is one, we read on B, and then we emit the, the result on R. So this conditionally acknowledges inputs. We'll start with our standard WCHD reshuffling, where we've got you know, our, our standard handshakes, we wait for the input request, we lower the input enable, wait for the input request to reset, raise the input enable. On the output side, we raise the output request and then wait for the output enable to trigger. So the first thing we need to do is take this uh, input and replicate it for A and B, right? So like we did before in receiving multiple inputs, we're going to, uh, and or sending multiple outputs, we're gonna replicate across uh, this uh, channel. And so we're gonna pretend like we're, you know, we've got two different conditions, one for receiving on A and then sending an R and then one for receiving on B and then sending an R, right? So, uh, and all we've done is just replicated, we've, we've got two separate WCHB buffers here, one between A and R and one between B and R. Now, as it stands, they'll fight each other, right? You'll get interference between the two uh, channels because there's nothing synchronizing these two WCHB buffers. So we need to use C to do that. And ultimately, we can just take C and stick it into the uh, into the guards for the output requests. And so we're going to take these two, you know, these output requests that are currently uh, interfering, and we're going to make some internal nodes for those, R0 and R1, in order to tell us which condition is which. And then we're going to, you know, when either condition is true, we're gonna send out on R. But we still have that interference, right? There, these two handshakes can kind of run at different speeds and, and end up in different locations. One can be resetting while the other is setting. And so you'll get instabilities on our output request. So we use C to delineate between those two conditions, right? So if C is false, then we uh, run condition zero with R0 and R0 acknowledges A. And then we, it waits for C to be false before resetting and then uh, raising the input acknowledge on A. Now, R0 doesn't touch B in any way. And it doesn't wait for B on the input. It doesn't acknowledge B uh, on the input. It just totally ignores it. C.P, so when C is true, R1 triggers. And that acknowledges the input on B. And so you get got this kind of symmetric uh, uh, conditional logic. Now both conditions R0 and R1 acknowledge the input condition channel C.E, which means that on reset you need to make sure that they're both false. And that acknowledgement on C is ultimately the thing that synchronizes them, that keeps uh, token reception on A and token reception on B mutually exclusive. Does that make sense? Okay. For conditional outputs, it looks similar. So we receive our condition on C. We receive the whatever data we want to uh, split on L. And then 
if C is zero, we send on A. If C is one, we send on B. So let's take a look at this. We have our normal WCHB. We are going to replicate on R this time rather than L. So R gets set to A and then we replicate. Again, now we have um, kind of a standard copy at this point. So this will run correctly at the moment um, as long as you know you want a copy. It will emit a value on both A and B and so we want to prevent that. So we take this and, we change it to an or, and we use, once again, use the condition on C to delineate between the two conditions, right? So if C is false, we send on A, and then that triggers both LE and CE to be lowered. If uh, C is true, then we send on B, which again triggers LE and CE both to be lowered. And so this or, um, the, the kind of mutual exclusivity required by this or is guaranteed by the encoding uh, protocol on C. Then we can take these two input enables and create a wire fork as we've done before. Um, we'll just call that Effie and then assign them both as aliases. So do those two transformations make sense? On the conditional inputs, it seems like there's a, I'm trying to think through it, but it feels like there's a possibility that if you change C at the wrong time, you can screw up a different one of those other cycles. It so, seems like there might be essentially either a glitch or some kind of like essentially setup violation, but you don't have those here. So let's run through this. Uh, C dot F goes from zero to one. So it goes true. So R zero is enabled. Um, currently, nothing else is enabled because everything else depends on R zero. So R0 goes high, that allows R.R .R to go high, and it allows C.E to go low, and it allows A.E to go low. So those are our three transitions in parallel. Um, in order for R0 to go low, C.F must go low, acknowledging the transition on C.E. A dot R must go low, acknowledging the transition on A dot E, and R dot E must go low, acknowledging the transition on R dot R. And so this C element synchronizes those three parallel transitions. Now the reset phase looks similar. R zero goes low. That enables the transition on R dot R down and on C dot E down, up and on a dot e up now once again if we go up to the top here both of these c elements acknowledge all three signals and so in each case in the set and the reset phase this the the set c elements and the reset of the c elements synchronize all three of those cycles does that make sense? Yep, thank you very much. Okay, let's just get into some examples. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna implement is a conditional merge. Uh, we have our uh, conditional channel C, then we have A, B, and R. And so when C is false, we're going to, going to receive from A and emit on R. When C is true, we're going to receive from B and emit on R. Um, we have a source for A and B. We have a source for C with data. And we have a sync for R. And those are instantiated down at the bottom here. So source for C, source for A and B, sync for R. 
and our conditional merge isn't changing at the very bottom. So we have C, we have A, we have B, and R. Let's start with a standard WCHB from A to R. So A dot or R dot E and A dot D zero or A dot specific channel. Uh, we just have an E one of so it'd be A dot D zero underscore R dot D zero down. We need to define R dot D underscore R dot D zero. So C one of two underscore R or C one of one. And underscore r dot d zero when that is low, set r dot d zero high. That drives a dot e low, and then we have the reset phase, so not r dot e and not a dot d zero. Underscore r dot d zero high. When that is high, drive r dot drive our output request r dot d zero low. And when that is low, drive our input enable on A dot E high. So that's just a straightforward WCHB to give us some structure. Now let's replicate these T elements for B. So we're, we're gonna just replicate all of the gates, B, and then this will cause B dot E down. This drives B. And this will drive a dot or b dot e up. We need an a pair of internal nodes to handle these two conditions. So we're going to convert this to a one of c one of two, and we're going to call it underscore r. And then we're going to call I guess we can let's just call this uh, I don't know uh, underscore x and then x. So we have underscore x dot d zero underscore x dot d one x dot d zero x dot d one so that we can differentiate our two conditions. Okay. So now our two conditions are happening on x0 and x1. We need to use x0 and, and x1 to drive r. So uh, that would normally be x at d0 or x at d1 uh, underscore r d down, not underscore r d, r dot d0 up. So we'd have a bool underscore rd. And then we complete the or gate down here. So not x at d0 and not x at d1 underscore rd up. And that drives r at d0 down. OK. So this is still going to be unstable because we need to add our uh, C channel here. So for either of these conditions, C dot E is going to be driven low. So if X dot D zero is high or X dot D one is high, C dot E is driven low. Because each token that we emit on R represents a new condition that we need to pull in from C. Uh, we need to do the reset phase to not x dot d zero and not x dot d one. C dot e up. And so now we need to wait for the uh, data to arrive on C to select which condition we're actually in. So for A, we're going to be using C dot d zero. And for B, we're going to be using C dot d one. And we need the reset phase, so and not c dot d zero, and not c dot d one. So that could complete our whole operator here, our merge. 
there is an optimization that we can do um, regarding R. Now, because these uh, X channel, you know, this, these X values are used to drive the enable low, we can actually pull the internal nodes of those C elements to drive the output requests. And that won't cause an instability because we're actually not uh, breaking any cycles. We're simply, simply pulling a gate out into one of the cycles. And so this could be not underscore or not underscore r dot d zero up. And then this can be down here, uh, underscore x dot d zero and underscore x dot d one r dot d zero down. And so that saves us a few transitions on the output request. Okay, so let's do reset. Uh, both our output conditions need to be reset low, uh, as in any WCHB. So we just use our standard not g.reset or not g.reset or reset or, not g dot underscore s reset or and then over here, we need to block these rules with g dot underscore s reset and, and g dot underscore s reset and. So let's run this and see what happens. Uh, I've got a not CMOS implementable production rule. Let's take a look at that. Uh, zero one, zero one. Those are pulled down. These are pulled up. I'm not on, sure. On the first line of the last like stanza of code, I think you're missing a not before the x.d1. Uh, good catch. Thank you. All right. Make e1, Pearson, e1.prs, and source Pearson.rc, source e1.rc, and we cycle. Okay, so no instability. We can, if we run PRSIM, uh, let's go ahead and run PRSIM uh, e1.prs. And we're gonna wanna send this out actually to a file. So let me uh, take a look at e2.rc, or sorry, e1.rc. And I'm going to take this advance and I'm going to turn it into a cycle. At the end. Pearson e1.prs pipe t out to let's call it e1.sim. And so this will emit both to the standard out and to our file e1.sim. Uh, it will for some reason not show the prompt unfortunately, but we can still say source e1.rc and it'll run. So now we have our e1.sim and it's just the straight simulation, digital simulation. If we, we, we have a tool built into this Docker container, which is called sim2vcd.py. And so we can give it e1.sim and we can save it to e1.vcd. Uh, 
And so that takes a second. Then we can run GTK wave against that VCD file. And we can see our simulation in a waveform viewer, our digital simulation in a waveform viewer, if we'd like. And so we have a.d0. Let's zoom out. We have b.d0. We have c.d0 and c.d1. Uh, and we have a.e and b.e and c.e. Now, I have random timing, so this is all over the place. We zoom in a bit. We have a request on A and a request on B. Our first input on C is a scroll over. Here we go, request on A, request on B. Our first input on C is true. And so our input on B is acknowledged here, along with our input on C being acknowledged. Those acknowledgements allow us to lower our request on C and our request on B. before moving on to the next. And so for the first couple of requests, we're only seeing c.d1 get toggled until around here. I'm gonna scroll over. So right around here, c.d0 goes high. And that allows us to acknowledge a.e here. C.e is acknowledged here. And a.d0 resets, leaving B untouched. And we can see the outputs on R and RE as well. So if I turn off random timing or make it, you know, significantly restrict random timing. So let's take a look at E1.RC. And if I turn this back into 0, 10, that it'll still be random inputs from C, but much less randomness in the timing. And let's rerun the simulation. So PRSM. E1.prs, pipe t, e1.sim, source, e1.rc. Okay. Now let's convert that sim to vcd, e1.sim to e1.vcd. And then open it with GTK wave. And we should see much less randomness here. So let's take a look at A.D0 and zoom out. B.D0, C.D0, C.D1, A.E, B.E, C.E. And then finally, r.e0, r.e. Now there's much less going on here. You can kind of see uh, quite clearly when A is selected or when B is selected, right? They don't ever go down at the same time. They alternate. Up at the top lines here. So first, B is acknowledged, then A is acknowledged, then B is acknowledged, then A, then A, then B, then A. Okay. So we can run this through our analog simulation. 
PRSM in V.PRS. Let's take a look at our PRSM in RC. Um, before I build, I changed up my RC file. I think probably for the next few lectures, I'll, I'll start separating these RC files a bit. Uh, one with random timing for the digital simulation, one without for the analog. Uh, and it would be cycle doesn't play well with the analog simulation, which is why we have to use advance. Here's him in VWS. Source Pearson RC. So it opens up the netlist. And it's 2000 and runs the simulation. So we can say PR view test.spy.prn. And we open up GAW. And we'll be able to see the same thing. So we have a.d0. Uh, a dot, let's call it, let's do B dot T zero, then A dot E, B dot E, and then C dot D zero, C dot D one, and C dot E. So let's actually put a.e and b.e into the same thing here and let's recolor this so we can see it. So you can see when c.d1 goes up, b is acknowledged. When c.d0 goes up, a is acknowledged. Does that make sense? Okay, to move on to the next example. E2. So this time we're building a split. We've got our conditional channel C, we've got our input channel L, and we've got our output channels A and B. The same sources and sinks. Uh, we've got a source for C, a source for L, and then a sink, two sinks, one for A and one for B. All right, I'm gonna start working through this. So once again, we'll set up a straightforward WCHB between uh, L and A, just to get us started. So uh, A.E and L.D0 drives A underscore A.D0 down, which drives A.D0 up, and that drives L.E. That's our set phase. Our reset phase is symmetric. So uh, the, the reset of A.E and of the input request drives underscore A.D0 high. Uh, I missed tilted it, which drives uh, A.D0 low which drives L.E high. So standard WC for your shuffling. We will want to replicate this on B. So there's one, B.E and drives B.D0 down. We have, we replicate that C element and this is going to be, for now, we're just going to call it and b.d0, as we saw in the slides. We'll replicate this C element. b.e drives the applicable request on b. 
And then we have and not b.c0. Okay, so that's a copy. But we want to make this uh, conditional. So we need to kind of guard our output requests using C. So we can take, you know, when we know we want uh, A dot D zero to be driven high when C is false. So this would be and C dot D zero. And we want B to be driven high when C is true. So this would be and C dot D one. Then we have our input enable being lowered. And now these are mutually exclusive events. So either A, either the, the upper request on A is raised or the upper request on B, but not both. Then on the reset phase, we need to reset, we need to wait for the signals on C to reset. So this would be and not C dot D0 and not C dot D1. Your reservation has ended. So that mostly covers our handshake. We still need to drive the input enable on C. So let's give ourselves some internal nodes. So we have C1 of one for underscore A, underscore B. We have bool, let's call it LE. And we're gonna want to set L dot E equal to this bool, and we're gonna wanna set uh, C dot E equal to that for our wire for. And then we can just set this up as our internal node. Finally, we wanna implement reset. And same as always, drive our output requests low on reset. So we'll do that using the normal way. So there's our handshake. Let's check our digital simulation. So let's give it random timing, remove the bounds, make this a cycle and make this a cycle. So we can really check a bunch of different interleavings. Make E2, PRSM, e2.prs, source e2.rc, and cycle. So it's not showing any instabilities or interference. I'm not gonna walk through the GTK wave stuff again. Um, let's take a look at the, at the analog simulation. So I'm gonna go back and edit my RC file, make it kind of bounded on randomness to make it easier to look at. And then this is going to be advanced 40 and advanced 40. Make E2, CD E2. So we're in our analog simulation directory now. Here's him in Vita PRS. Source of Pearson Darcy. And we can advance a little while longer to see more of the simulation. Before we PR view, that's about spider PRN. And bring up the ball. So let's take a look at A.D0. And let's put B dot D0 in the same one there. You can see that they're mutually exclusive. We have C dot D0, C dot D1. And you can see that the requests on A and B line up with the requests on C. We have A dot E and B dot E, again, 
mutually exclusive. And we have CETA E, which covers every single uh, output. Finally, we have our output request on, uh, sorry, our input request on L and our um, input enable. So that would just be CE. So any questions about this before we talk about the, the PCHB and? Let's go back to lecture eight. And we have E2 dot act. Um, instead of implementing a WCHB, I'm going to implement a PCHB. So, start with our PRS body. And then we're going to want our a standard PCHB reshuffling uh, between A and R. So, this is going to be uh, we have our enable signal and a.d0 drives underscore r.d0. And let's just make this data list to begin with. So that drives r.d0 high. We'll need to compute validity of our input and output rails. So A.D0 drives underscore LV uh, low. R.D0 drives underscore RB low. And when our input and outputs are both valid, that drives our input enable. So if not underscore LV and not underscore RV, then we have a C element, underscore LE goes high, and that drives LE. So the A dot E low. Okay. So if we go back to our TCHB uh, slides, what we've just implemented is when the output request and the input request is valid, we've implemented this C element followed by this inverter. Okay, so let's go back. Now we need to implement this C element. So this is the input enable and the output enable C element together. So L dot or so A dot E, if that is low and R dot E is low then underscore enable goes high, which drives enable low. So that's this C element. And that's the set phase of a standard PCHB reshuffling. So let's take a look at the reset phase. So if enable is low, then we drive underscore R dot D zero high, which drives R dot D zero low. So that's implementing the set phase, or sorry, the reset phase of this asymmetric C element. Now we need the reset phase of this C element, which is this stuff. 
So if we say not a dot d zero underscore lv high, not r dot d zero underscore rv high, not let me say underscore lv and underscore rv underscore le low, which drives a dot e high. So that's a straightforward inverse of the set phase. And now we need the reset phase of this. It's a C element, so it's just A dot E and R dot E underscore enable down, which drives enable up. Okay. So I'm gonna put a little bit of space between our set and reset phases here. This is a standard W or a standard PCHP or shotgun. Following this. So the question then is we have B, and we need to kind of add the bin. We have our we have data. Right, so we need to make this a data PCHB. So which do we do first? Let's tackle the data on A. So we have A dot D zero drives R dot D zero. We're gonna to need to replicate that. A dot D one, R dot D one. Replicate that C element in its entirety. And the reset phase, we're gonna to to do the same thing. For R dot D one, and R dot B one. Okay. So that leaves us this that we have come up with and this, our input and output values. So A dot D zero or A dot D one, that's when A is valid. R dot D zero or R dot D one, those are validity checks on an E1 of two encoding. And then on the reset phase, we have and not a dot D1, and not a R dot D1. And so that's the reset phase of a validity check. And what that is saying is if we go back to our lecture on encoding data. That verifies that we are in one of these two valid states in our one of two encoding. So either the either D0 is high or D1 is high. We're not in a neutral state. So that's what these check. Okay, that covers data for A and R. So now we need to add in B. So this is an, an AND gate, which means that both have to be true for the output to be true. And one has to be false for the output to be false. Now keep in mind that we don't have to check the validity on these on these expressions, right? We don't have to check for the validity of A and the validity of B because that is done by our L and R valid gate here. Now we do need to verify that B is valid. So let's call this instead of underscore LV, we'll call this underscore AV. And then down here as well, underscore AV. And then we need to replicate this for B. So this checks that B is valid. And we need to add this into our gate for LE.
Further, we need to acknowledge both A and B here. So we need a, some, you know, some kind of internal node. We'll call it LE. And we're going to assign A.E equals LE and B.E equals LE. So this is going to be LE goes low. Instead of not AE, this can be not LE. We don't need a check for them separately because it's the same node. So that just about covers our set phase. Let's check our reset phase. In our reset phase, lowering our output requests doesn't have any dependency on the input data, right? Because this is our asymmetric C element. We do need to set up the other side of the validity check for B. So let's do that. And we need to include it in our underscore LE rule here. And instead of A.E plus, this needs to be LE. And we replace A.E with LE here. And so that's the reset phase. And so you'll notice that we have early out. We've resolved all the issues with the long reset rules. Right, the long rules in the reset phase. And it's stable because we checked the validity on both a and B. This is what makes the PCHB reshuffling stronger for handling complex data than the WCHB reshuffling. It's this fact right here. Right? You're minimizing the the, the length of the transistor stacks on the reset phase of the output requests. Furthermore, we can reset this pretty straightforward by making sure that enable is low. So that would mean forcing this rule to fire and preventing this rule from firing. We have one other C element that we may run into trouble with and that's LE. Now we know that RV will be high, that underscore RV will be high because our output requests are reset low. Which means that this is enabled and this is disabled. So we don't need a rule here blocking this from firing during reset, but we do need a rule here ensuring that it fires during reset. So we can use P reset for that to set LE high. And so Another strength of the PCHB reshuffling is that you need minimal overhead for reset circuitry. So we've got our implementation here. Let's give it a shot. So make E2. Let's actually check E2.rc. Let's make it challenging for us and, and have fully random timing just to verify everything. Make E2. Let's check E2. Act. I forgot to find the signals, all of the internal signals. So let's do that. So we have underscore R. That's a C1 of 2. We have a bunch of Booleans. Underscore AV. Underscore BV. Underscore RV 
underscore le le underscore enable and enable. And I think that covers it. Just going down the line here. So let's try again. Make queen, make e2. Uh, I duplicated le. So let's un undo that. All right, there we go. PRSIM e2.prs source e2.rc and cycle. That works. No instabilities. So we talked about early out last time and I showed you a bunch of examples of that. Um, I just wanted to show you the solution to this. I don't think we need to go into the analog simulation and see it. Uh, 